Good morning. Thank you. I, I was told how friendly everyone is in Kansas City. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Thanks. I have one little rule. I know all y'all have um, cell phones. So before we start, please take your cell phones out and turn them on. I want you tweeting and Facebooking <laughs> and LinkedIn-ing. My uh, Twitter handle is my name, at Bruce Turkel. But more importantly, when you brand your meetings, when you put on your events, everyone sitting at your tables is doing it as well. And so starting by asking people to turn them off is rather unrealistic these days. And there's a lot of changes that we need to understand as we look to brand our businesses, and that's one of them. And by the way, to those of you who are both meeting planners and also speakers, understand that these cell phones and the communications is the new competition that we have to deal with. If I'm not interesting enough to keep your attention because you need to find out that your neighbor just got home from the store, then I haven't done my job. And in fact, if your meeting is not interesting enough to keep people's attention, then you haven't done their job, your job. And if they pull their phones out and do it anyways, it often has nothing to do with you. They're just interested in whatever else is going on every time that little thing buzzes in our pocket and we get a charge of dopamine in our system. And it's, ooh, what was the, the Sally Fields line? You like me, you like me. Let me pull it out. So feel free. Take them out, write on them, use them. It's okay with me. What we're going to talk today about is how to brand your meetings. It used to be, and I think Jeff, wherever he is sitting, where are you, Jeff? Jeff, here he is. I think Jeff will agree with this, that we used to say that if you wanted to understand something, if you wanted to figure something out, follow the money. If you want to find out the crime, follow the money. That'll take you to the source. If you want to find out about corruption, and if you want to find out about how to grow your business, follow the money. Look to where the money is, and that'll give you the information that you need to brand your business. Today, though, it's a little bit different. Today, I would say that the new way to look at it is to follow the marketing. Because if you figure out what the marketing reasons are for things, you will figure out where the success is. If you're watching the politicians today, and it's a great spectator sport, if you're not doing it, you should be, and you wonder, why did that guy say that? Why did she say that? Follow the marketing. They're not making decisions anymore based on issues. They're making decisions based on marketing. If you want to understand why a friend of yours did something, follow the marketing. Who are they marketing themselves to? Their spouse, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their children, their boss. Look at the marketing. If you do, you will find that the answers to branding your company, your business, and your event is actually hidden in plain view. It's right there. If you remember at the end of The Wizard of Oz, the good witch said to Dorothy, you had it in you all the time. Remember, Dorothy went on that long trip in order to figure out how to get back home to Kansas, as a matter of fact. And uh, the, the good witch said, Glenda said, you had it in you all the time. All you needed to do was click your heels together and say, there's no place like home. OK, how pissed would you be <laughs> if you had to hang out with those three freaks, fight with a witch, and flying monkeys, for Pete's sakes, when you had it in you all along. I don't think Glenda was such a good witch. <laughs> but the answer is right there. How you brand your meeting, you have it in you all along. But you don't see it. You don't identify it. So what I want to do this morning is just show you something that you all watched. You all saw it happening. And it all happened based on follow the marketing, follow the branding. And I hate to say it, but most folks didn't see it. We're all paying attention to the election right now, but I realize the passions might be a little high on today's election. So let's go back four years. Let's talk about the last election. And by the way, this is not a political discussion. Don't either applaud or throw things at me. Um, if you'd like afterwards to go for a beer and discuss politics, I'd love to do it. But that's not what this is about. What we're looking at is marketing. It's irrelevant which side you're on. It's irrelevant how you felt about what happened, good, bad, doesn't matter. But let's look at the election. We have two products. Both of the products are trying to get us to buy them. Because let's face it, an election is a purchase. We got these two products and we buy them. Yes, we buy them with votes and not dollars, but still, we're buying the product. And the product that wins, it's a zero-sum game. You either go home with the consumer or they take you off the shelf and throw you away. So we have these two products. On the one side, on the right, we have a man by the name of John McCain. He's running for president as a Republican. On the other side, on the left, we have a man by the name of Barack Hussein Obama running for president as a Democrat. But again, we're not looking at people. We're looking at products. That's where the learning is. 
So let's start with this one. If you were branding your product, if you were branding your event, I think you would agree that one of the most important things is the name. People have to know what the name is. They have to remember the name. They have to say, I'm going to this event. I'm buying that product. So let's look at the name. John McCain. Sounds like George Bush. Sounds like Bill Clinton. Sounds like Jimmy Carter. Sounds like Thomas Jefferson. Sounds like a president. Pretty good naming. If you were going to name a pre hey, what should we call our next president? John McCain. Yeah, sounds like a president. OK, let's go to this side. You're already la see, you're, you already know how to do this. Barack. Does anybody know what it means? It happens to mean lightning in Hebrew. My guess is not only do not, most American voters didn't know that, but most Jewish voters don't even know that either. So Barack means lightning. Yeah, is it good, bad? Really doesn't mean anything. Let's go to the middle name. If I asked you all to take that piece of paper that you have that the hotel gave you and write down the top 100 names for an American president, how many of you have Hussein on the list? OK, 200 names. As John Stewart said, the only name worse would have been to run for president under the name Adolf Hitler, right? Hussein is probably not the name you would choose. And then last name, Osama, excuse me, Obama. I mean, we were told, we were told all the time, Obama rhymes with Osama. Even guys that liked him made that mistake. So Barack Hussein Obama, probably not your first choice, agreed? So if this was a game show, the big, uh, we get the number one over this guy's head. OK, next thing when you're selling a product, awareness. Awareness is critical. Have they ever heard of it before? How can you buy a product you've never heard of? Awareness is critical. If you're selling an event, have people heard of it? The people you want to come, the people you want to speak, the people you want to sponsor. Have they ever heard of you? Because if they haven't, how are they going to pick you? So awareness is critical. Over here, we have a guy who was a war hero for years. I think it was the Crimean War that uh, <laughs> he actually became a war hero. And then he was a senator since like Reconstruction, right? So we knew about him for a really long time. The guy has awareness. Over here, we have a guy who was a senator, but not for very long because he gave up his Senate seat in order to run for president. And be before that, he was a community activist. Now, again, community activists, you could see it's good, you could say it's bad, irrelevant. Community means small. So a few people knew him in a community. So if you're doing the awareness test, once again, we get the big neon two uh, uh, over this guy and nothing over this guy. And then we get to the issue that nobody talks about but is critical in products, which is packaging. What is your package? What does your product look like? What does your event look like? Where are you holding it? What do the materials look like? Packaging is critical. So over here we have a guy who, let's face it, looks like a president. White, middle-aged, that's a euphemism, but white, <laughs> middle-aged, bald guy. Looks like a president. If you go to the uh, Hall of Presidents in Disney World where they have all those animatics who are you know, doing this, um, and you go down the list, you could see them all. If you go to the Capitol building and you look at the paintings that they have of every president, you start with George Washington, there's Thomas Jefferson, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Grover Cleveland, the Roosevelt boys, the Bush boys, they all have something in common, right? They look like this guy. This guy, not so much. You could do the Sesame Street song, right? One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> so packaging, again, good or bad, doesn't matter. Packaging, you'd say, OK, that's not what we're used to seeing as a president. So now we have three ones over here. Uh, uh, uh. This guy is winning. Yet, when we went to vote, the country voted unanimously for this guy, even though he had those three major liabilities. So the question becomes, exactly, why? Why did they vote for this guy? Remember what we talked about, follow the marketing. What was the marketing? Well, this guy told us, I am a maverick. You remember that? I am a maverick. Now, let's take that apart a little bit. I am a maverick. First of all, white, bald, middle-aged, senator, war hero. Maverick? Is there anything maverick-y about that? The message was completely incongruent with who the guy was. Second of all, what is a maverick? As far as any baby boomer knows, a Maverick is a crappy car that Ford built. <laughs> so the message, I am a Maverick, 
didn't really resonate. This guy over here, someone we didn't know, didn't recognize, and could not remember his name, was smart enough to have two words. You all know them. Hope and change. Right. Hope and change. He promised us hope and change. Again, I see some people grumbling. Whether it came true or not, whether you believe it or not, irrelevant. We're talking about selling a product. Hope and change. I get it. I know what this guy stands for. Hope and change. It's positive. It's uplifting. It's a rusty old car. It's positive. It's uplifting. Then this guy said, I am not a maverick. What? You're a maverick? You're not a maverick. OK, I get that. No, I don't. Then he said, change you can believe in. You remember that? To suggest that this guy was lying to us. Change you can believe in. So he was determining his brand by this brand. And then the beauty part, the brilliance. Whoever wrote this, one of the best cop. It's the second best copyright line in the history of American products. And the line was, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, affirmative, we, inclusive, can, aspirational. Yes, we can. This guy said, I, personal, am not, negative, a maverick. Bad car. This guy <laughs> said, yes, we can. It's the second best copy line ever written. And then we all went out and vote. And again, unanimously, this guy won. But before you think I'm taking sides here, look what happened once the election was over. Look what happened when the visionary became a functionary. The first issue was health care. That's what the country was promised, health care. This guy did not identify his health care program. He didn't talk about it. He let the Senate talk about it. He let the Congress talk about it. He let the pundits talk about it. He let the press talk about it. He let the press on one side talk about it. He let the press on the other side talk about it. He never talked about it. He never defined the issue. He did it beautifully when he was running. He didn't do it at all when he was managing. He never defined the issue. So a guy in Iowa, a guy by the name of Chuck Grassley, he defined the issue, didn't he? Pulling the plug on grandma. Five words pulling the plug on grandma, and it almost ended health care. In fact, before the, the health care passed, everybody was pretty sure that it would not pass. And then a, a mama grizzly in Alaska in an igloo on Facebook and Twitter, two words, death panels. And she, Sarah Palin, defined the issue, and health care was effectively killed. Now, it did pass. But it passed without the public option. It passed without the pharmaceutical negotiation. And as you can see, what's happened since with what's now called Obamacare and Romneycare, it became a big issue. Why? Because he never defined the issue. Did it great in the, in the election, second best line ever in advertising, but he never defined the issue. Now, I know what you all are thinking, which is, OK, that's great, and, but what does that have to do with me? And the answer is, as you look to brand your meeting, it's those three words. Define the issue. What does your meeting stand for? And not what does it stand for for you, I am a maverick, but what does it stand for for the people that you want to participate? Very simple. What's in it for them? I mean, look at the best advertising that's been done and the best branding that's been done for the companies we look at and we respect. And think about how they have defined their issue. Allstate has been saying the same thing for 50 years, right? You're in good hands. Now, can you imagine the presentation, the Allstate presentation? The, the marketing director or the advertising agency guy went to the CEO, went to the board of directors and said, OK, here's what we're going to do. You're in good hands. You know somebody raised their hand and said, why are we saying you're in great hands? or you're in excellent hands, but you're in good hands to find the issue. You're safe, you're comfortable, you're warm. Think about other brands. Um, Walmart, three words, always low prices. Always low prices. When you walk into a Walmart, you know what to expect. You know what you're going to get. And you may be going there to buy diapers, dog food, or, or uh, powder or stuff for your garden or tires for your car. They could say incredible selection. They could say enormous stores. They could say we bring stuff from China and sell. But they don't, do they? <laughs> they say always low prices. 
Now, you're busy, not any of you, but a lot of people meeting planners, planning their meetings, are talking, we have this, we have that, we have the other thing, we have donuts. Woohoo! you have donuts. I'm coming to your conference because you got donuts. But, but uh, Walmart is as complicated a business as can be. Always low prices. How about Volvo? Volvo sells one thing, right? Safety. That's all they sell. They're in the most complicated business in the world. They sell in 147 countries. Imagine the regulations they have to deal with. You have two, city, two states for one city. Imagine the regulation they have to deal with. They're in the manufacturing business. They're in the R&D business. They're in the ecology business. They are in the logistics business. They're in the repair business. They're in the retail business. They sell new product. They sell old product. They're in every business you can imagine, and yet they sell one thing. Safety. BMW has been the ultimate driving machine since 1973. The cars change, the way they advertise the cars change, but the ultimate driving machine. I know what they sell. I know what I'm going to get out of it. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Let me use cars for an example. Let me continue with that. In Germany, there are five car companies. There's Opel, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Volkswagen, and Audi. They all manufacture cars. They all make exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, if you look at the Opel Senator, the Mercedes C-Class, the BMW 3 Series, the Audi uh, A4, and the Volkswagen Passat, they are all within an inch of each other in height, in length, in width, in wheelbase. If you get in sort of that pewterish metallic silver color, they look the same. They have uh, leather interiors. If you were blindfolded and you were inside, well, and hopefully you weren't driving, um, you can't even tell the difference. And yet the car companies need you to tell the difference, because otherwise, why would you buy one instead of another, right? So right on the front, right between the headlights, they put a logo. They all happen to use circles. Opel's logo looks like that. It's a lightning bolt. Mercedes-Benz logo, you all know it. It's kind of a peace sign looking thing. It looks like that. But look at them geometrically, if you would, for a minute. What you'll see is that Opel divides their circle into halves, and Mercedes-Benz divides their circle into thirds. BMW, as I said, the ultimate driving machine, they divide their circle into quarters. Volkswagen, all they did was take the Mercedes-Benz logo and flip it over, and then they removed the vertical and they replaced it with a W. And then as far as I know, the guys from Audi came along. They didn't even know what to do. They said the heck with it. They just took the other guy's circles. <laughs> so even the logos are essentially the same. Yet the cars stand for very different things, don't they? What does a Mercedes-Benz stand for? Luxury, good. I'm sorry, status, yes, absolutely, status. I heard class, image, great. The one thing that nobody ever wants to say? Yeah, they're expensive. So a Mercedes Benz has a great image, they're expensive, they're luxurious, they're statusy, and they're classy, right? Now, BMW, is a BMW luxurious? Sure, statusy, yep, classy, of course. Good image? Expensive? Oh, yeah. But they're one more thing, aren't they? What else? Fast. Performance, fast, sporty. Exactly right. Per, I always write performance, but it's per four minutes. OK, so a Mercedes is all these things. BMW is all those things, but it's also performance. Now, here is where branding gets really interesting. It's what I call a GBM, a goosebump moment. Or, or here is what I demonstrate what a dork I am, because this gets me excited, okay? The attributes of the brand, image, price, luxury, status, and class, if you do your job right, the attributes of the brand become the attributes of the consumer. So a Mercedes-Benz is luxurious, statusy, classy, etc. A Mercedes-Benz driver has a great image, is affluent, is luxurious, has status, and has class, right? 
And a BMW driver is all those things, but tends to be a little younger, a little trendier, a little hipper. It's what demographers call PDBs, which ironically does not stand for people driving BMWs, but people dressed in black. And if you look around the room, all the cool people, all the cool kids are always wearing black, right? Wear black and voguing. Uh, so a friend of mine just moved to New York, and she moved back to New York, and she sent me an email. I'm so happy. I moved back to New York. I'm back in black. So <laughs> the, the attributes of the brand become the attributes of the consumer. We used to say, you are what you eat. We now say, you are what you consume. So here's the key. If you've defined your issue, if you know what your event is about, and not what it's about for you, but what it's about for the people you want to attend, then how do you make the attributes of your event something that they want to brag about, something that they take on themselves? I am a great uh, nurse anesthetist. Because I'm going to the Kansas City Nurse Anesthetist Society event. How do you make that transition? It's all about the consumer experience. There's no wonder why the dealerships where you buy these cars have big mirrored windows. It's so when you get in the car to test drive it, you look over and you go, hey. <laughs> More men than women do that, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> but that's what your brand needs to be about. We market Miami. We market Miami tourism. We've worked very hard to create that kind of brand. If I say to you, I'm going away this weekend, and you say, where are you going? And I say, I'm going to Florida. Oh, great, you'll be warm. That, well, that's a given, right? Where are you going in Florida? If I say I'm going to Orlando, you know where I'm going, who I'm going with, and what I'm going to do there, right? If I say I'm going to Tampa, you know where I'm going, you kind of have an idea who I might be going with, and you might have some idea of what I'm going to do when I get there. If I say I'm going to Miami, you know where I'm going, who I'm not going with, <laughs> and pretty much what I'm going to do there. And by the way, it's not just Miami. Think about Vegas. What does Vegas say? What is their marketing? What happens here stays here, right? They're not selling all the things they do, they are selling sin. Because why else wouldn't you want people to know about it? And it used to be that gambling and drinking was considered sinful, but that's not true anymore when you can gamble anywhere. So now they're selling, we're all adults here, right? They're selling adultery. What happens here stays here. Why do you want it to happen? I mean, stay here, right? They're sell, they've niched sin. Now here's the key. They've gone from the seven deadly down to one. But here's the key. It doesn't mean you're going to do anything wrong when you're there. And most people don't. It means you could. You're selling the dream. You're selling the aspiration. And some people make a face at me when I talk about this and say, I went there, my husband went there, we didn't do that. It's OK. People don't do it. Think about these cars. This car is designed to go 180 miles an hour on the Nürburgring, on the, on the Autobahn, right? How many people actually do that? If you live in Miami where I live, you can't go faster than 35 miles an hour on the expressway anyways. <laughs> but you could. Or maybe you drive a Mercedes Benz, they have the big SUVs. My wife has an SUV, not a Mercedes, but my wife has an SUV. We live in Miami. We have, let me, let me inventory this for you. We have no mountains, no snow, no ice, no dirt roads and yet she drives a four-wheel drive vehicle that's a... <laughs> Why? Because you could. Think about your events. I already told you to get your phones out, right? And people are going to be sitting in the best speaker that you worked so hard to get, and while you, that speaker's up there speaking their little hearts out, your, your uh, attendees are on the phone checking if Susie fed the cat, right? But they could learn something. It's about an aspiration. So as you look to brand your event, you know to make it all about them, all about the consumer. You know to define your issue. You know to create the type of event that will move the benefits of the event from the event to the consumer, and it needs to be aspirational. There's one more thing it needs to be. And I want to take you on a little, little trip 
to tell you this story. We're going to go from Kansas City in 2012 to Leipzig, Germany in 1740s. We're going to meet with a guy by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. Anybody ever hear of him? Raise your hand. Okay, here's a rule. This means yes. This means no. This, which is what I saw, is what the uh, dinosaurs did in Jurassic Park, okay? <laughs> so we're going to try again. Johann Sebastian Bach, who's heard of him? If you haven't heard of him, by the way, raise your hand anyways. Because you don't want your neighbor to look over and go, oh. Okay, Johann Sebastian Bach was a composer. We all know that. Very famous. Com I'm not going to test you on what he wrote, don't worry. But he was a very famous composer. However, he wasn't born a famous composer, and he wasn't a composer, famous composer for years. He still had to make a living. So he was a piano, well, he wasn't a piano teacher because pianos had not yet been invented. They came along at the end of his life. He was actually a spinet teacher. And a spinet, as far as I know, is kind of like a harpsichord. It's a miniature piano. And a lot of the music that he actually became the melodies for his um, compositions originally were pieces that he used on the spinet to teach his students. And one of the ones, maybe his most famous, was a piece of music called Minuet in G. Any of you who have kids who have taken piano lessons are familiar with Minuet in G. How many, how many have kids who've taken piano lessons? How many of you have kids? Do the rest of you know what kids are? <laughs> were it, how many of you were kids? OK, I'm not going to get everyone's hands up. It's the trouble of being a type A control freak personality. I want everyone's hands up. It's not going to happen. I accept, I accept that. OK, back to the story. So Minuet and G. It's critical that you understand Minuet and G in order to brand your event. So I had asked to have a baby grand piano here in the room for me so I could play Minuet and G for you. Two problems. As Mr. Plum informed me, your organization has something called a budget. <laughs> and somehow, that was out of the budget. And problem number two, I can't play the piano. But I, I realized at one point that, that Bach didn't play the piano either. He actually played a miniature piano called a spinet. So I brought a miniature spinet for you, right here. And I'm going to play Minuet and G, because you need to know it. And it goes like this. sorry that my wife is not in the room when somebody applauds <laughs> when I play the harmonica. Okay, so, so we know Minuet and G, even my tortured rendition. You got it? All right, so we're going to go from Leipzig, Germany, 1740, to Vicksburg, Mississippi, 1940. And we're going to meet with one of my personal heroes, a man by the name of Sonny Boy Williamson. Now, Sonny Boy is about as different as different can be from Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach was short. Sonny Boy Williamson was six foot six. Johann Sebastian Bach wore that red velvet kind of Eddie Munster suit with the, with the knickers and the pilgrim shoes. And uh, Sonny Boy had been to England where he played with the Yardbirds, and he dressed in all black. Even in the heat of the Delta summer, the man wore all black. He wore a bowler cap. Um, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach wore that kind of gray. A revolutionary wig. So they were very, very different, but they had a couple similarities. One of them was that they were both composers. And Sonny Boy wrote lots of music that you know. It was redone by, well, the Yardbirds, the Animals, Led Zeppelin. Um, and, and he became not as famous as he should have been during his life, but very, very, very famous afterwards. One of the pieces of music that he wrote is a piece of music called Peachy Tree. And Peachy Tree, Peachy Tree sounds like this. I know what you're thinking. Why is he doing this? Here's the amazing thing. 
Both of those pieces of music are as different as different can be, right? Both of those guys are as different as different can be. Yet they both use exactly the same seven notes. I mean, if you look at the harmonica, it's only got ten holes. They use exactly the same seven notes. If you remember the sound of music, it was do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Yeah, there's do, but that's an octave. Do, do, it's the same note. Every piece of Western music ever written uses those same seven notes. And every meeting, every event, every conference uses the same exact assets. Speakers, offsites, tables wrapped in, with, with bows, name tags, they're all the same. Yet it's your job to make them different. Just like those two guys did with the music, just like those two guys did when they ran for office. If you define your issue, if you make it about your consumer, if you make it aspirational and you make it unique, these techniques will work for you. They will work whether you're doing an event, they'll work if you're creating music, and they'll work if you want to be the President of the United States. Thank you.